The modality principle is my favorite of the multimedia principles. Uh, in this short lecture, we will uh, uh, focus on the learning objectives uh, that you should be able to describe the modality principle and why it is effective for learning. And you should be able to recognize when the modality principle has been violated and when it's been applied well. Uh, this is the third of the six uh, um, media element principles of e-learning that we'll be discussing. Um, so here's the uh, uh, thinking process for you. Uh, um, which is better for student learning? What do your intuitions say? Should um, an animation be accompanied with spoken narration or should it be a, should the animation have the words be on screen in text uh, uh, so for example you could have a verbal description of lightning processes uh, processes presented in audio like spoken by a narrator or with on screen text so how would that look so here's uh, a version where uh, uh, this is there's a an animation or an image here. It could be a static image uh, or an animation. And the narrator is saying the words here. As the air in this updraft cools, water vapor condenses into water droplets and forms a cloud. Uh, no text on the screen, right? Uh, in contrast, here's the alternative. The, uh, the same words are on the screen. Uh, uh, rather than being uh, spoken, right? There's no off-screen narration. So again, what's your intuition? From which uh, intervention are you going to get a better learning outcome? Uh, I will say when I've done this in class and had hands raised, many students say on screen uh, text will be better. Uh, but in fact, uh, repeated results from studies that uh, Mayer, who's the, uh, one of the co-authors of, of the book, Clark and Mayer, um, done repeated studies showing that the uh, learning gain on transfer assessments is higher in the animation with narration than in the animation with on-screen text. Uh, and this just represents pretty abstractly, I guess, a, a number of results of another number of, uh, of those studies. You can certainly drill it down in, to look at some of the specifics of those studies uh, by following references in the textbook. Um, so, uh, spoken narration and animation, but why? Uh, well, so in words, the notion is that presenting text and animation at the same time can overload visual memory and leaves auditory working memory unused. So let's take a look at that visually. Um, we're, we're, what uh, is happening in the mind when students are presented with printed words and pictures. How are they processed in sensory and working memory? Uh, you remember, you, I hope you remember the images of, uh, 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 of, of a sense of cognitive processing of sensory input and, and working memory. So we're going to use that image here to think about what happens when we have printed words and pictures in a display uh, they're perceived by our sem sensory system memory um, through what? Ears? No, there's nothing to hear. It's only through eyes, and both the printed words and the pictures are processed by that by our eyes or by our sensory system, and stored in associated uh, visual processing parts of our brain, which are separate from auditory, sound, speech, or phonetic processing. Uh, different words for more or less the same thing, right? So this part's going unused, and this part is getting overloaded. So in contrast, what, how are spoken words and pictures processed in sensory memory? Uh, so replace printed words with uh, spoken words, and pictures stay the same. Redraw the arrows. What's it going to look like? You know, this, is, this part's going to stay the same. Um, think about what that's going to look like. I hope you drew this picture in your mind, that the spoken words go to your ears and then make use of phonetic processing, uh, whereas the pictures, again, go to the eyes. Now you're using dual channels, two different channels to process the information. And, of course, 
as you may recall from the larger diagram, there's processing that goes on to generative processing that's going to go on to build long-term memory structures. Um, and if that processing can make use of both of these memory sources rather than just one, that it's going to be more likely to, to work and not overload working memory. So it's been tested in, in a variety of ses settings with large effect size in interactive environments and high school classroom environments across multiple domains. Some examples are how brakes work, how lightning forms, uh, mathematics studies, electrical engineering. Uh, um, there's some 21 experiments showing its effectiveness. And uh, um, it, it, it is uh, better when uh, the material is, is reasonably difficult for students, um, so less skilled uh, learners um, or when the material and or when the material is more complex. In that case, if the material is fast paced and or cannot be controlled by the learner, then um, giving them the chance to use both of these memory sources is going to be particularly advantageous. Um, if more skilled or, or less complex material um, is, is being processed going back to this diagram, it might be that, that the eyes and visual processing capacity are not overwhelmed and, and, and they may not see much difference in that case. Uh, so uh, eye tracking studies, uh, another interesting phenomena here. You could imagine that uh, part of the issue with, uh, with the display going back to these images uh, um, like, like this where the text is here and then you're supposed to be, you know, look, thinking about how uh, the, as the air in the updraft cools, water vapor condenses, you know, the, the process. You're supposed to be looking here, but of course if you're uh, also supposed to be reading this, your eyes have to move back and forth, right? Um, so one question is, is the modality effect just about the getting rid of the need to make those eye movements? Because here you can have your eyes looking at this while your ears are processing the narrated text. It turns out some uh, interesting studies have uh, presented the, uh, the, the uh, visual part uh, by itself in both conditions. And then the, the visual goes away and in one condition now there's a blank screen and you hear the narration and in the other condition the text is on the screen but the image is not there in either case. So there's no eye movement issue in that case, right? Uh, and that, those studies really isolate uh, whether there's an effect of, uh, of the working memory. And it turns out, um, even in those cases where it's not about the eye movements, there is a benefit for the audio narr narration. So the modality effect works there. And it's really about both the fact that you're in, in this case, your eyes have to move back and forth and that you're overloading visual processing and not taking advantage of phonetic or uh, auditory processing as you are in the spoken case. Um, there are exceptions when uh, technical terms, vocabulary, or equations are, uh, are, are part of the learning process. It's good to put those on the screen so that they can be processed. But, you know, these are usually technical terms. You know, just might be a single word or phrase. An equation is reasonably short, right? It's not a lot of text. Giving direction so learners can refer back. Uh, certainly one advantage of text is that self-pacing is easier to achieve. With audio, it's harder to achieve. Um, so in these cases, some redundancy is desirable. And, and we'll talk about redundancy uh, actually coming up soon. Uh, no narration is acceptable when the pace of the material can be controlled by the learner and when the material is easy, there's only textual information or there is only textual information and no visuals. Then, then actually when it's just the words, um, there's uh, not a lot of difference between whether those words are presented in speech or text. And in fact, if pacing is a issue, right, that, uh, and, and I think I've mentioned this before, that uh, in MOOCs with audio-based lectures, sometimes second language learners uh, are doing worse with the videos and better with the 
readings because they can read at their own pace, right? But that's a case where there are no visuals, right? Um, here's uh, an example uh, that you should listen to the description of this and, and how in Khan Academy the modal, modality principle is being applied. There's very limited uh, verbal information here. There is a, a, a term, um, but most of the talking over it is uh, is done. Uh, well, the words are in the talking over it. Uh, uh, note also this, this use of this uh, Khan Academy thing, uh, teaching about as you listen to this, it's it's a, it's a, also an example of uh, using uh, um, audio over diagrams uh, for learning for you too. Those are uh, a number of these lectures. So uh, um, I hope you feel comfortable in being able to describe the modality principle and why it's effective for learning. And uh, um, I hope you can recognize when the modality principle is being violated and when it's being applied well. And you should also be able to recognize cases where it seems like it might be violated, but it not really, or, and it really isn't. So, for example, in a case where you're comparing uh, words, words only presented in audio versus on screen, you might say, well, audio is better, but that isn't what the modality effect says. That's not a case where it's being uh, uh, applied because there's no picture in, in that scenario. So uh, uh, that's one of the nuances about uh, uh, the principle uh, that you should be able to follow and understand.